Greetings and welcome back to Junior English. We are uh, here now to analyze, discuss one of the most famous poems in the English language. Just to say it out loud. Edgar Allan Poe's The Raven has been, no pun intended, raved about and against for a very long time. Now I'm with you in your hymnals at 288 to 289. I just want to do a, a little bit of summary work before we get to this title called The Raven. The first thing I want to point out uh, is the life of Edgar Allan Poe. Go ahead and look at it and do the mathematics really quickly. 1809 to 1849. Whoa! So some of these cats we've been reading live into their 70s and into their 80s, not Poe. The other thing I'll point out with you, do you see that on page 288, 289, look at the little headings. Well, I mean, I'm not going to go into it with you because I've already shown this to you before, but look at the little headings there. Look how many words are disturbing words on 288, 289. Are you looking at them with me? Notice in the first heading, troubled childhood. Look at the heading on 289, struggling. Look at the next heading, unhappy ending. Whoa! Let's just say it out loud. Poe lives a tragic life. Let's write that down again. I know that we did it with the fall of the House of Usher, but let's do it again. Poe lives a tragic life. One of the ways I like to say this about Poe is, imagine this, if every person you loved seemed to die on you. Dude, after a while, you'd start to take this stuff personal. Do you know what I'm saying? Everybody you care for. You fall in love with somebody, they crank. You have family members you love, they crank. You meet new people that you really like, they crank. This seems to be the life of this poor guy. And in the middle of all of this, he starts writing some of the most important stuff in the American literary tradition. Okay? I can give you one statistic that will show this to you. You are reading from a junior anthology, yes? In your freshman year, you had a different anthology as a different color. In your sophomore year, another anthology, a collection of writings. And now in your junior year, you have this, uh, this American offerings. In those three anthologies, a freshman, sophomore, junior, the writer, because the anthology is made by the same book company, the writer who is given more print space than any other author is Edgar Allan Poe. Maybe some of you will recall in the freshman year, the cask of Imantilado, a story about a man being buried alive. Some of you are probably familiar with the telltale heart about a guy who kills a man, cuts him up into small parts, and puts his heart underneath the floorboard and boom, 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 boom. The heart starts beating, drives the man crazy. Some of you are probably familiar with The Mask of Red Death, a classic story by Poe about the plague and the ways in which people totally freak out when bad things start happening. The Fall of the House of Usher is, of course, his greatest title. Notice I've listed several titles that you could easily now be writing down at level 3A. Other titles that are going to be very important for Poe. Again, The Telltale Heart, the Cask of Imantilado. Some of you are familiar with his uh, terrifying story, The Pit and the Pendulum, about a man who is being incarcerated in a prison cell with a large hole in the center of it, and he is strapped down with an axe that swings back and forth over his head and is lowering when out of the hole comes the large rats. Some of us will ask, what kind of mind creates this kind of gothic literature? Gothic literature. Now, I'm using a term that's actually in your hymnal on page 291. We already looked at this with our discussion of the fall uh, of the House of Usher, but I wanted to point it out to you again. Gothic, dark literature, okay? It means that you're going to have some suspense that's rooted in the human psyche's negative energies. It is a dark kind of experience, okay? Poe was a great poet, and he wrote some of America's most important lines of poetry, but none are more important than this poem called The Raven. Let's go ahead now and turn to it, shall we? There's any number of ways to experience this poem. 
I want to point out, though, at 2B right away, how this poem is constructed. Do you see it? I'm with you on page 312 now. Page 312 of your hymnals. Let's take a look at the way this poem is constructed. Do you see it? The stanzas are a certain number of lines. Go ahead and count up a couple of stanzas just to see what I'm talking about. Every stanza has how many lines in it? Do you see it? And notice that the final line of each stanza has an indention. Do you see it? Every one is going to be constructed this way. There will be a certain kind of rhythm as well. Notice the opening lines. Once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered weak and weary over many a quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore. There is a certain kind of rhythm. Bum, ba, 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 bum. You'll see it. You'll see it and you'll hear it in the reading of the poem itself. All right? Now, finally, this is a poem that will lead to questions about what happens at the end. So I would write that down at level one. What happens at the end of this poem? It is a poem about a man who is reading alone in his room in the middle of the night, stormy night, when all of a sudden he hears the knock. And he's going to be very interested in who's visiting him in the middle of the night. But when he goes to the door, nobody. When he goes to the window, nobody. And then, all of a sudden, appearing in his room is a large black bird, a crow, or a raven. Now, for those of us who like birds, we kind of have seen these really large birds. Let's go ahead and put in your notes really quickly that Poe is playing a very ancient game. The game works like this. People live and then they die. When they die, they go somewhere to another place, usually understood as in the underworld. Their soul goes there, not their body. Out of that place, those souls can actually leave and visit back in this world. The bird that's often associated with death is the raven or the crow because it's black, it's got a metallic sheen to it, and if you've ever studied a crow at the park and looked at their eyes and looked at the way they twist their head around and stuff, they almost seem to kind of be paying attention to you. And so very early on, the Greeks saw crows as omens. I'd write that word down. An omen. It's a bad sign. So when our chap in the middle of the night who's reading sees the raven, he is going to immediately wonder what's going on. He tries to talk to this bird and he asks the bird, where are you from? The bird will have only a single word that it will speak. The word is nevermore. Which can be interpreted in a lot of ways, like, dude, I'm not talking to you, or I've got nothing to say, or you need to stop asking these questions. The question that the man asks is, my girl, my girl just recently died. Her name is Lenore. Did you see her on the other side? Are you coming back to tell me something about her? At the end of the poem, we'll get there. We'll ask, what happens to this guy? And then we're going to really ask, what's going on in this seriously whacked out poem? Very good practice for reading. Try and really sit up now. Use your pen uh, tip and really try and follow every one of the words of this poem. Enjoy the reading of this poem, but try to begin to put together what actually is happening in this strangely twisted poem. Okay, the bird that comes from the, he thinks, Plutonian shore. Pluto is the other word for Hades, the god of the underworld. Of course, before it was no longer considered a planet, Pluto was considered that planet that was the farthest out in our solar system, right? So here we go, the, the uh, raven. The Raven by Edgar Allan Poe. Once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered weak and weary, over many a quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore. While I nodded, nearly napping, suddenly there came a tapping 
as of someone gently rapping, rapping at my chamber door. Tis some visitor, I muttered, tapping at my chamber door, only this and nothing more. Ah, distinctly I remember it was in the bleak December, and each separate dying ember wrought its ghost upon the floor. Eagerly I wished the morrow, vainly I had tried to borrow from my books surcease of sorrow, sorrow for the lost Lenore, for the rare and radiant maiden whom the angels name Lenore, nameless here forevermore. And the silken, sad, uncertain rustling of each purple curtain thrilled me, filled me with fantastic terrors never felt before, so that now, to still the beating of my heart, I stood repeating, to some visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door, some late visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door. This it is, and nothing more. Presently my soul grew stronger, hesitating then no longer. Sir, said I, or oh, madam, truly your forgiveness I implore, but the fact is I was napping, and so gently you came rapping, and so faintly you came tapping, tapping at my chamber door, that I scarce was sure I heard you. Here I opened wide the door. Darkness there, and nothing more. Deep into that darkness peering, long I stood there wondering, fearing, doubting, dreaming dreams no mortal ever dared to dream before. But the silence was unbroken, and the darkness gave no token. And the only word there spoken was the whispered word, Lenore. This I whispered, and an echo murmured back the word, Lenore. Merely this, and nothing more. Then into the chamber turning, all my soul within me burning, soon I heard again a tapping somewhat louder than before. Surely, said I, surely that is something at my window lattice. Let me see then what thereat is, and this mystery explore. Let my heart be still a moment, and this mystery explore. Tis the wind, and nothing more. Open here I flung the shutter, when with many a flirt and flutter, in there stepped a stately raven of the saintly days of yore. Not the least obeisance made he, not an instant stopped or stayed he, but with mien of lord or lady, perched above my chamber door, perched upon a bust of palace, just above my chamber door, perched and sat, and nothing more. Then this ebony bird, beguiling my sad fancy into smiling, by the grave and stern decorum of the countenance it wore, Though thy crest be shorn and shaven, thou, I said, art sure no craven, ghastly grim and ancient raven wandering from the nightly shore. Tell me what thy lordly name is on the night's plutonian shore, quoth the raven, nevermore. Much I marveled this ungainly fowl to hear discourse so plainly, though its answer little meaning little relevancy bore, for we cannot help agreeing that no sublunary being ever yet was blessed with seeing bird above his chamber door, bird or beast upon the sculptured bust above his chamber door, with such name as nevermore. But the raven, sitting lonely on the placid bust, spoke only that one word, as if his soul in that one word he did outpour. Nothing farther then he uttered, not a feather then he fluttered, till I scarcely more than muttered, Other friends have flown before, on the morrow he will leave me, as my hopes have flown before. Quoth the 
the raven nevermore. Wondering at the stillness broken by reply so aptly spoken, Doubtless, said I, what it utters is its only stock and store, caught from some unhappy master, whom unmerciful disaster followed fast and followed faster. So when hope he would adjure, stern despair returned, instead of the sweet hope he dared adjure. That sad answer, nevermore. But the raven still beguiling all my sad soul into smiling, straight I wheeled a cushioned seat in front of bird and bust and door. Then upon the velvet sinking, I betook myself to linking fancy unto fancy, thinking what this ominous bird of yore, what this grim, ungainly, ghastly, gaunt, and ominous bird of yore meant in croaking nevermore. This I sat engaged in guessing, but no syllable expressing to the fowl whose fiery eyes now burned into my bosom's core. This and more I sat divining, with my head at ease reclining on the cushion's velvet lining that the lamplight gloated o'er, but whose velvet violet lining with the lamplight gloating o'er. She shall press, ah, uh, never more. Then methought the air grew denser, perfumed from an unseen censer, swung by angels whose faint footfalls tinkled on the tufted floor. Wretch, I cried, thy God hath lent thee, by these angels he hath sent thee respite. Respite and nepenthe from thy memories of Lenore. Let me quaff this kind nepenthe and forget this lost Lenore. Quoth the raven, nevermore. Prophet, said I, thing of evil, prophet still, if bird or devil, whether tempter sent or whether tempest tossed thee here ashore, Desolate, yet all undaunted on this desert land enchanted, on this home by horror haunted. Tell me truly, I implore, is there, is there balm in Gilead? Tell me, tell me, I implore. Quoth the raven, nevermore. Prophet, said I, thing of evil, Prophet still, if bird or devil, by that heaven that bends above us, by that God we both adore, tell this soul with sorrow laden, if within the distant Aden it shall clasp a sainted maiden whom the angels name Lenore, clasp a rare and radiant maiden whom the angels name Lenore. Quoth the raven, never more. Be that word our sign of parting, bird or fiend, I shrieked up starting. Get thee back into the tempest and the night's plutonium shore. Leave no black plume as a token of that lie thy soul hath spoken. Leave my loneliness unbroken. Quit the bust above my door. Take thy beak from out my heart and take thy form from off my door. Quoth. The raven, never more. And the raven, never flitting, still is sitting, still is sitting, on the pallid bust of Pallas, just above my chamber door. And his eyes have all the seeming of a demon that is dreaming, and the lamplight o'er him streaming throws his shadow on the floor. And my soul from out that shadow that lies floating on the floor shall be lifted never more. Now there's so many different ways to approach a text like this poem. And so much commentary has been written on this poem. 
I want to point out, though, in your books, if you'll back up just a couple of pages to 311, I'm not going to go through this page with you, but I just want you to see it. There's a lot of commentary that started around this poem right away. Not unlike a movie, for example, that gets made, where for, or a song that becomes very popular, and immediately you go online and Google about why did they write this song? Like, what's the meaning behind the words of the song? Right away, this poem became very popular. And people wanted to know what was going on when you decided to write this poem. And here is parts of an essay that Poe wrote to try to explain what was going on. Probably the funniest part of all of this is that originally he thought that the bird he would use would be a parrot because a parrot can, what, talk, right? Okay, and so he thought he would use a parrot. And then later he decided that the raven, the crow, is better because of the melancholy tone, he said, he wanted to write. There were two things about this poem that he said he for sure wanted to do. One, he wanted it to be short enough so that it could be read in one sitting. It takes about five and a half minutes. By the way, if you are following closely, you notice several moments that our reader was reading words that were a little bit different. Did any of you notice this? That there was a little bit... Good, good. Some of you saw that. There's a couple of times in this poem when the reader was reading from a different text. There were multiple versions of this poem that were published, right? In different times as Poe was doing still editing of the poem. The other thing that he said he wanted was not only a poem that was short, but he wanted a poem that treated melancholy. Let's get that word in our notes and know what we're talking about. What is melancholy? Right? Of or related to sorrow and loneliness. <sighs> Sadness. Okay? And so he writes a poem in which he's going to play a game of a sort. He's going to make you, the reader, ask a simple question 